All right, we're live. Hello, everyone. Good uh, afternoon, good morning, good night, wherever you're at in this world. It's Dr. Rob Kiltz. It's conversations with Kiltz are kind of our conversations, but we're really, our topics go about health and wellness. And I'm really excited about having Brian Sanders, a filmmaker, Food Lies, and we're going to talk about Food Lies today, mm -hmm. host of one of the top five nutrition podcasts, a peak human, uh, a global speaker, uh, graduated from UCLA. I went to USC mm. um, uh, close by, but I did some graduate work there. And you're also a health coach in Evolve Healthcare and uh, co-founder of a health education company called Sapien. And uh, you're also really um, um, active in regenerative agriculture. We're going to talk a lot about that in nose to tail. So welcome, Brian. How you been? Oh, I'm great. Thanks for having me back. Yeah. Oh, always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. And I guess we should really jump in to talk about food lies. And maybe you could tell us about your new uh, uh, series, uh, movie, and uh, what it's about and how people can find it and get some inspiration to watch it. Yeah, well, it's been my main project for years now. It's a, turned into a six-part series. So started five years ago when I saw a vegan film. People may have heard of What the Health. One of the original first was Cowspiracy. Well, there's many, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's Cowspiracy, What the Health, and there was Game Changers is the, the newest one. So, uh, well, I started earlier than that. I, I changed my life doing the opposite of a vegan diet, right? So I started eating more meat, more animal foods, got healthier. So I, I saw What the Health and um, got pretty angry, actually, because I, I lost both my parents when I was about 30 from eating I think from eating the food pyramid diet and just following the standard recommendations that just led them to prediabetes and chronic disease. And um, so, yeah, I had my own health troubles. I was just following the food pyramid diet for my whole life. So let's say you graduated UCLA with a degree in mechanical engineering, and obviously now you're a health and wellness um, uh, aficionado and expert around the globe. And we uh, honor you for that. Tell us a little bit about how you got there. Yeah, it, it was a circuitous path. Uh, I think the engineering helped me get a good start on the, the foundations of yeah doing science and looking at the root cause of problems and kind of led me to realize that what we're doing is not science. <laughs> and it's not a healthcare system. It's a sick care system, all that kind of stuff. I'm sure everyone, knowing, everyone watching or listening kind of understands that we're in a sick care system and they're just putting Band-Aids and no one's looking at the root cause of problems, which are from diet and lifestyle. And so, yeah, I've always been into film and I've always been into being active and I thought I was healthy until I wasn't, right? So that that kind of just shook me up when I was about 30. Like I said, I lost my parents. I had to take a look at my health and I, I thought I was doing everything right because I was following the food pyramid. I was mm -hmm. doing lean meats and all the grains and the you know vegetables and the whole thing. And it wasn't serving me. I had all these different problems. I, I was overweight. I had joint problems. I had um, chronic overuse and I had like acid reflux. I had a million things, allergies. And the minute I changed to more animal based diet, it, they all went away. And I just felt like a new person. My whole body comp didn't change. So that's what led me down this path. Quit my job, just went all in on this stuff. Eventually teamed up with Dr. Gary. That was Evolve Healthcare. Started doing health coaching stuff, working with patients, started making the film. Uh, I went a little bit out of order, but yeah, I started making the film. It, it was just something that I was obsessed with. I just read every book, went to lectures, listened to podcasts, looked at the, you know, the nutrition research. It was just all I did for, for years and years and what I still do. Um, and, you know, interviewing all these great people for the film and for my podcast. So it kind of just came out of nowhere. Why, why, why is it so confusing uh, health and wellness via nutrition because um, I was just reading a, a recent journal from an expert opinion in OBGYN that women that are pregnant should eat the uh, my pregnancy plate, which is fruits and vegetables, seeds and nuts, lean meat, no red meat. Three quarters of it was carbohydrate plant based. And I'm sure you came across all of this in your research for your your uh, series. Why, why is there such a confusion in what we should eat? Uh, well, I know exactly why it, it's, it's a hard reality of nature that plant foods are really profitable to process. 
I boiled it down to that. So that is a truth of nature that they are very profitable to process. And everything kind of stems from that. And it started, you know, 12,000 years ago with agriculture and we could, and you know, the pharaohs and these, the rulers could accumulate all the wealth by, by saving up all the grains and storing them and taking taxes. And it all really stems from there. I actually did a presentation on this recently at KetoCon here in Austin, and it was called Exposing the Trillion Dollar Agenda Against Red Meat. And I went into the entire details of it and how it goes from there. I won't do the whole thing again, but if you could see how that extends out where once people realize that they could make a lot of money off of processing plant foods, that's still what they do today. What, what is Bill Gates doing? What is James Cameron, who produced Game Changers, doing? He has a $140 million investment in pea protein, and then he comes out with a vegan propaganda film telling you to eat fake meat and pea protein. So it's always about the money. It's always about the power, the control. Same thing, right? How do the leaders lead They with the power? And it's sad because the power, interesting enough, the power is passed on generationally. So the same people that were in power uh, 12,000 years ago are somehow still the same people in power today. There's the hierarchy. Look at the the uh, the English uh, 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 hierarchy of, of uh, the queen and the kings and the royalty. And the same thing somehow is happening in the rest of the world. It's no different. Um the the how do we communicate i'm a physician uh mm -hmm. so many of my patients are sick from from exactly what you said processed food or or ultimately uh lean meat no red meat lots of fruits and vegetables and three to six meals a day and the hardest part is to have this conversation and i obviously like you am really gung-ho about uh health and wellness and our nutrition and a game-changing uh, uh, idea and health coaching. What's what do you think the best way to approach this is? Because obviously, fighting the lies, I'm not sure how well that works. Uh, how do we get uh, to share the story with more people? Well, yeah, it's there's a lot to it. That's why I'm making the film. I think on one side, and sort of like a self indulgent self indulgent answer is to make a six part series that will hopefully be on Netflix and be seen by millions of people. So that's one side is you need to get the information out there and expose the lies. But I guess on an individual level or just something that people can do is, I think it's it's just a bottom up thing. It's never gonna happen from the top down. Everything from the top down is for their benefit, quote they, right? The establishment, whatever they are, the powers that be, when, when, it, when it comes down from them and that's what you hear in the media and the mainstream, it always benefits them. And you know it's almost the opposite of what they say will benefit you. If you do kind of the opposite of what they want, you usually end up better, right? It's it's kind of like a rule of thumb. They say avoid salt. I I eat salt. You know they say avoid red meat. I eat. It's it's just always the opposite. They they just it, it makes sense though, right? There's always been kind of this ruling class, and they've always had to keep the peasants in line, and they want to stay the ruling class. So yeah. The peasants, the prisoners, um, the slaves, and the soldiers ultimately are fed the mush, but the masters eat the meat. And interesting enough, red meat is much more, red fatty meat is much more expensive than lean meats, uh, which is very interesting. And wh what's your take on, on consumption of fat and, and the concern about carnivore, and cholesterol and heart disease. Maybe you could share your research and knowledge on that with our, with mm -hmm. with those uh, watching and listening today. Yeah, the ribeye. The ribeye <laughs> is the most expensive. It's the most desirable cut with all the fat. Yeah, I mean, again, opposite of what you've been told. It makes sense though, because for their highly processed products to be bad, I mean, sorry, for their highly processed products to be good, your meat has to be bad. You know, that there always has to be this kind of enemy and this two-sided thing. And that's actually a big theme of the film series is that we're fighting the wrong enemy. And mm -hmm. it's really obvious that all that you hear is going against what's true because they're making all the money. And, you know, so, so yeah. So specifically with the, the fat and the cholesterol, that is a long story <laughs> that goes back to the 50s. The short version um, is Eisenhower had a heart attack and they 
need to figure out why this is also when they're smoking two packs a day you know you got like your baby in the, the room and you're they're smoking cigarettes and they're you know they're eating the margarine and the crisco which is a whole nother story and you know they, they started getting all these processed foods but really uh again the, the the blame was put on the wrong thing so yes we were getting more and more processed foods in our diet we're getting more and more seed oils and margarine and fake fats and trans fats and plant-based fats. And then, then there was this other guy who was like, Hey, maybe it's all these processed sugars and flours and grains and oils is a problem. His name was uh, Thomas Yudkin. And, and then Ansel Keys was like, Oh, but maybe, what if it's all the fat? And basically the quick story is Ansel Keys won by using a lot of spurious correlations. And, you know, he did the seven country study and, you know, it's, it's, it's old story, but it was really great for the food industry. And I think they're looking back, you could say, oh, you know, maybe we didn't have all the signs back then. But when you kind of look at just how the world works and we were talking about the ruling class and maybe, you know, they kind of pushed in that direction, right? I don't want to get conspiratorial, but maybe it was pushed in that direction where all of a sudden fat is bad. And now all the food companies and all these giant organizations that go even beyond just companies. I mean, it's like the entire United States is subsidizing corn, wheat, and soy. Uh, so, you know, this really opened the door to all these processed foods once the decree was that fat is bad or cholesterol is bad. But, you know, the interesting part is, and is uh, we have a lot of scientists and doctors that are kind of at the forefront of, of uh, doing the research and writing the papers and publishing this, you would think that they had the intelligence and the knowledge to be able to sift through this in order to answer the question for their patients, which they do have the Hippocratic Oath to um, care for and do no harm. What, what's, what's behind the fact that they don't hear this and they continue to perpetuate the, the, the food lies? Yeah, that's another long story too. You got to trace it back to even, wow, how the medical schools were even developed and who funded them. And uh, the, you can you can do a search for Rockefeller Medicine. It's a great, it's hard to find because Google will probably block it. Rockefeller Medicine is a great little presentation done where a guy named uh, Stephen Corbett, I think his name is, uh, did a whole thing and explained how these were funded, how the schools were funded, why, how, how these textbooks got to be. The, the fact that they even they tried to they had a successful smear campaign against natural medicine, like using food and diet and lifestyle as medicine. And they it became uh, the term even quack, right? That that anyone who practiced natural medicine was a quack. And that was a, sp a very purposeful to, um, miss, you know, misinformation, disinformation, uh, smear campaign against, you know, natural healing, anything that wasn't surgeries or pills. So you can go as far back as you want, but this still is perpetuated in all, again, goes back to the money and all of the money that's made by all the big food industries and pharmaceutical industries, they can just perpetuate this. They have all the money. It really stems from the fact that processed foods, foods are so profitable that they have so much money to do the lobbying, to fund the studies, to do marketing campaigns saying their food is good. You know, the Coca-Cola starting initiatives like the, ILSI that was, you know, energy balance consortium and the ILSI is saying that, oh, it's just calories and you should drink Coca-Cola. And it's just, if you know, if you're fat, it's because you're a dummy and you didn't count calories well enough or that you didn't exercise enough because, you know, our Coke is fine. You just have to count calories. So my God, we could spend all day talking about why this system is the way it is. Yeah. It's sad. And I know that I've been chastised in my community uh, for talking about it and reprimanded at the medical school, the hospital, and also to our licensing board in uh, New York State. So uh, there's there's lots, so many pieces of the puzzle going on. Now, tell us a little bit about um, your work in regenerative um, uh, agriculture, uh, grazing animals, and there's a question here uh, regarding regarding grass fed versus grain fed, and I you might or may not be able to answer that question, but mm -hmm. um, it has to do with the uh, um, agriculture and 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 uh, and and beef. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, my company's nose a tail, so I have firsthand experience of not making money off of meat. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, like how to not make money is start a meat company. That uh, it's basically a negative uh, uh, money pit. 
You so, like the animals. That it's you do it for the animals. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know why I do it. I, I'm I'm the only dummy that's trying to do that. I, I mean, looking back, I should have just made some processed food like keto bar or something, and then I could have marked it up, you know, eight eight x, and then actually made a profit. So, I yeah, I'm very very much the hard way learning that you don't make money off of agriculture about gr uh, growing animals and much less growing them well. Uh, so. Regenerative ag would be the best way to do it, right? This is how animals naturally should be raised and you move them around on the grass and they stay on grass their whole life. And it actually regenerates the soil, puts carbon back in the soil, you know, really high level view. It's what we all should be doing, but it all needs to be, you know, it, it's really hard to change. It would have to, we'd have to change all these subsidies. We'd have to change so many things to, to get there. We'd have to stop growing all this corn, wheat and soy, and then we'd have, use some of that land to grow animals on and and then they're you know they produce manure naturally and they eat the grass and stimulate growth and you know, this whole system that works perfectly well and it's what we used before all of these super industrial extractive techniques came around so that's the high level view of of regenerative ag mm -hmm. and and to i could talk about uh grain fed versus grass fed absolutely so i definitely would would say that having an animal gr grass finished its whole life, especially eating a diverse diet of you know all different forages, is definitely the healthiest. And I interviewed a doctor Stefan von Vliet who studies this, and they look uh, with a mass spectrometer and they look at all these compounds that are in that meat when you when you grow it well. But I also say don't be afraid necessarily of grain fed meat because I know people have budgetary constraints. And I, I just don't like, you know, the fear mongering, especially like I'm in a position where my company, you know, is grass fed. So I should be saying, oh, grass fed or nothing, buy my stuff. Absolutely not. I, I am buy what you can afford and it, it can be better if it's for grass finish and it can be even better if it's regenerative because then you could even regenerate the land and do something good. And I think it's absolutely great to support farmers too, support the ranchers doing this. Then I feel pretty like happy paying extra for the good meat because i'm like oh take my money you know like you're doing a good thing this is great what percentage of of, of cattle is is grazed on on regenerative agriculture is it is it substantially growing is it slow growing mm. it, are there any subsidies to help the farmers doing that i don't think there's really any programs maybe there's some private programs that are popping up uh it's a very small percentage but the good thing is all cattle, all, all you know, steer and, and cows spend the first two thirds of their life on grass. Right. So if they go to the feedlot, at least they're out on grass for the first two thirds of their life. They're in the cow calf operation. The problem is most, you know, above 90 percent go to the feedlot. But and then there's a, you know, single digit percentage remains on grass and, mm -hmm. you know, does it the right way. So there's really not a, I mean, farmers are the ones that are probably suffering the most here and the middlemen and the, the, it's a commodity, basically, uh, the, uh, that, that the money's made at the, the top level and not at the a lower level and all of this, even, even, uh, uh, plants, uh, the farmer is probably suffering a tremendous amount. And, uh, what, how about larger, I mean, these larger feedlots. So, so essentially what I think I'm, I, I, I'm trying to answer for for our, for the community is that ultimately if you're eating grain fed versus grass fed you're not likely going to notice any substantial uh, change in your health because of that but what you're saying is that the overall health of the earth is going to be improved and the health of the cow cattle is going to be improved because they're foraging on what's natural to them well that and well and there are some health benefits. I don't think they're just like substantial. Like you definitely, they've done studies that show specifically like the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is better if it's grass-fed compared to grain-fed. And then some people will say, you know, you could accumulate pesticides or toxins if they're eating, you know, all the, the bad, you know, leftover grains and stuff like that. So, I yeah, maybe, you, I don't know if you can feel it. Some people, this is very controversial. Like some people are very uh, one way or the other on it. And I'm kind of just in the middle saying uh, you, you could get some health benefits from, well, you would 
from St Stefan von Leeds research, you do have these health benefits from the more, uh, the, all the compounds, these secondary compounds are called that are in the, the good regenerative grass finished meat because they're eating this diverse diet and they're getting so many more nutrients out of the, the forage. Well, you know, it's interesting because our, our, our the community is eating a tremendous amount of processed food and a lot of plant material more and more to the, the plant side versus the animal side. And so which part of it is really the cause of most health and uh, ill health issues that you've noticed in your research? Oh, yeah, definitely the plant side. Uh, they, that's a problem. That's why it's just the backwards world, right? That's why it's, it's almost everything is the opposite of what they say. That, that's kind of what I'm saying here with the grass fed versus grain fed or even processed meats. I actually don't have a big problem with sausage or bacon. You know, it's like it's just meat. You know, it's it's like we, we got to talk about like what really matters, right? What's going to move mm -hmm. the needle and what would move the needle is not eating a whole bunch of bread and corn and wheat and soy and fake meat and just trash that will move the needle. Then if you're, you know, 98 percent of the way there, if you, you get your diet dialed in and are eating animal foods and being thoughtful about the the plant foods you include and then, yeah, then you can get to the last couple percent. Right. If you, you get like the good stuff from your farmer's market. So, so the, what's, what, where did you, in your research on, on food and put um, the cause of cancers, so do, you, do you have any particular expertise in what you've learned about, you know, what the researchers think is the cause of cancer? Uh, not super specifically. I've interviewed some great people like Dr. Thomas Seyfried, who he, he calls it the, the metabolic a view of cancer or the, mm -hmm. you know, and so he, I, I kind of share his opinion that it's, I, I don't know, I don't remember it's a percentage, but something around 80% could be a metabolically driven causes. And that would, you know, be stemmed from eating the wrong foods, eating the highly processed foods. There's also, you know, for sure, environmental toxins, there's, you know, pesticides, glyphosates, there's heavy metals, there's radiation, you know, there's a million other things, but uh, I think largely it's from diet and lifestyle. Oh, of course, the lifestyle stuff too, right? Like not getting enough sleep, not, you know, sedentary, all this other stuff. So, so, so ultimately, uh, a high plant-based diet ultimately means a lot of sugar, which means a lot of metabolic disorder, which ultimately is Seyfried's and Otto Warburg's uh, uh, take on the cause of cancer as it's mitochondrial damage, most likely. Uh, any thoughts of, I talk a lot about fat, there's a question there about about fat and burning fat and and um, uh, eating more fat in our in our in our nutrition. Mm -hmm. what, have you found anything interesting on on that? Oh well, yeah. I mean, I've run on fat for pretty much six years, and I think it's amazing. Um, I did a pentathlon actually. I was trying to do a decathlon and do all ten events, but I couldn't find one, so I did a pentathlon. I didn't even eat that day. It was like, I just showed up, did the vent. Everyone there was sucking down those little goo packets of, of sugar. And, uh, I didn't, I didn't even eat. I think I ate a piece of liver, like kind of as a goof, uh, while I was, uh, at the oh. track meet a piece of raw liver, but I, I did, you know, the, what was it? The 200 meter dash, like long jump through the javelin, did all these events and, and ran a mile at the end. Uh, I beat everyone except for one person in the mile. This was in Toronto at a master's track, you know, big championship meet. So anyway, you, yeah, I, I, I love running on fat. It's, it's amazing. Well, my theory is we always run on fat. Sugar is never the energy for the mitochondria, but sugar is a glyco gly, gly, glycan, which is critical for glycosylation, which is the addition of a sugar to a protein. Without that, we die. Uh, but it's kind of another interesting talk. Maybe we can talk about it sometime because mm -hmm. I'm convinced that sugar is we're not we're not meant to ever consume uh, a plant or sugar in our natural diet, most likely, because there's no essential carbohydrate because our body is able to make uh, glycans. But uh, it, it is it is kind of an interesting topic that I think uh, uh, we could talk about at some mm -hmm. some other time. What, what's your thoughts on fasting? And then we'll get on to lifestyle because I really uh, enjoy your lifestyle thoughts and ideas, but uh, fasting. Yeah, fasting. So I I like to do sort of the intermittent fasting, I guess you call it. I, I don't eat breakfast. I eat probably in a seven hour eating window. 
So I'll eat around 1 p.m. and 8 p.m., something like that. A big lunch filled with bacon, bacon, beef sausage, eggs, uh, avocado. You know, I do some yogurt, just a lot of stuff like that. And um, freshly I made? Is it all oh, freshly made? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I cook everything myself, and it's all just single ingredient stuff. I mean, sausage, I technically it has, you know, a few seasonings in it. But basically this single ingredient stuff, cheese, stuff like that. And then for dinner, I'll do like a steak or lamb or, and I, I do some side dishes, um, some like sauteed onions and mushrooms. And, uh, but yeah, I, I love just the two, two meal a day, mostly animal foods. And I just am not hungry otherwise. And I think it's just a good balance of, of having sort of a somewhat normal life and eating schedule and just having a good amount of time not eating. Where, where do you put the um, the snacks in there? Do you get snacks or is it just that, <laughs> that sort of lunch and the dinner and nothing in between? Um, I don't think I've had a snacking? snack in three, f four years. I probably haven't had a snack. It doesn't interest me. I don't even get it. It's kind of hard because, I mean, one of my products is sort of a meat snack. It's biltong, right? It's like a beef jerky. I don't ever eat it. I'm like, when am I going to eat this? I don't snack. The only time I would eat it is I just make it part of my meal. But uh, yeah, I just think that, that snacking is such a big problem with normal life and, and culture and what's going on with the health problems. People are just always eating. So there are all these keto carnivore snacks. Uh, where do you think they fall on sort of, I always wonder if it's going to be that sort of that sneaky little thing to get us back to snacking uh, by picking up these, these keto mm. carnivore uh, snacks. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I personally don't really use them, but yes, I think they're, they're good for people transitioning. I also think they're good for traveling. So, mm, so yes. the only time I do eat my own built dong is on the airplane. And cool. uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's useful. Absolutely. It's just, yeah, I, I don't, yeah, I, I'm, yeah, I just don't like that idea that we always have to eat. I, I tend to like to bring my leftovers if I'm going to have a snack. I do one meal and I might have a little snack from time to time, but it's always like my leftover steak or a little bit of salami or something like that. But uh, I think that's, that's really a, an unnecessary thing. Uh, do you do any uh, more than 24 hour of fasting? uh i don't i don't i think i might be too lean i kind of have this idea of there there could be different diets based on your journey right and and i think some people yeah maybe even go overboard with the fasting or with doing omad for too long you know i i just think you can you you go on this journey you need to get away from the normal diet right and then you can get you know get a lot of good things done and then maybe see how you can optimize from there and 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 uh the other question is you're really into lifestyle and i know you love to exercise you love to move but you a lot of, you also a lot of integrate sort of a lot of mindfulness and things uh, of creativity tell us a little bit about your lifestyle hacks and how mm -hmm. critical they are to health and wellness yeah, super important. Sleep. I think sleep is one of my number one things that I do consistently. I actually figured out I'm more consistent with getting eight hours of sleep than anything else I do. <laughs> it's my number one most consistent thing. I always will get eight hours of sleep. And if something goes wrong, I will take a nap and try to like make up for it. So I'm a big believer in sleep, especially brain health for immune health. I, I see things break down. I see people who even eat well. And then they, they, they're up, they miss sleep for a few days in a row for a week. And then they're, they, they get sick. You know, I haven't been sick in seven or eight years. So I think there's something huge there. I do my vitamin D reading session. That's kind of my thing is every day around noon, I get out there in the Texas heat and I read a book by the pool and I do at least 20 minutes on my front and 20 minutes on my back and get that vitamin D, that is, it's just a ritual, right? Like this nice. is, I don't know if it's called a hack, it's a ritual, whatever it is, this is something very big in my life. And the last thing kind of is the, the movement side that I'm, I'm very interested in efficiency. Maybe it's that mechanical engineering thing, <laughs> that background where I just love to be efficient and effective. 
And uh, I just think like steady state cardio, like sort of like jogging is kind of for the birds. I just think it's sort of a waste of time, waste of energy. I don't think it does much for you other than kind of break down your joints. And I'm a fan of sprinting and lifting weights and just it's, you know, these are ancestral ways. I, I don't, we didn't, we didn't just jog. I mean, we did do some per persistence hunting perhaps. And you do like sort of a fast walk for a long period, mm -hmm. oh, but I'm down for walks. Yeah. I go for walks. If I don't work out, I can go for a walk. You know, that's great. Absolutely. But I, but uh, I sprint walk or lift weights or play sports. <laughs> but then, um, with, with the, the weightlifting thing, I, I actually have my own thing where I, I only lift for 25 minutes twice a week. So it's total, it's less than an hour per week. Yet I've had great results and, uh, you know, maintain muscle mass and, and very low body fat by doing drop sets to failure. If, um, people have heard of that, I use dumbbells and weighted dips and weighted pull-ups and stuff like that. And going to failure, I think is a really effective way to get a, a workout very quickly. And part of why I like it so much is because it's so easy to do and enjoyable. And, and it's not just some people think. To, if I need to work out, it needs to be an hour or more in the gym five days a week or, you know, some big thing. It's this big ordeal. And then they just end up not doing it. But with if my thing is only 25 minutes twice a week, I always do it. You know what I mean? And ultimately, walking is probably the thing that human beings have been able to do more than running. We can walk anything down probably for days and days and days. And in using your own body weight um, and doing simple calisthenics push-ups sit-ups uh, deep knee bends and and walking probably is is a healthy uh, lifestyle for for so many out there would you say absolutely you don't need to make it complicated you don't need the gym membership you can get so much done with your body weight and doing those types of things sprinting too i mean i, I just love to sprint humans sprinted or walked I, I i think those are the two things and then the yeah the, the lifting weights i mean that's just a bonus. Like mm -hmm. if you're, if you're, some people are very into CrossFit or bodybuilding. Absolutely. That's a whole different category of people. And you, you know, go do your thing. Absolutely. But if you're talking about like 80% of the people, they just need to do some, some movement a couple times a week. Yeah. Get creative. Uh, you mentioned your, your uh, reading, uh, uh, 20 minutes on each side. Is that every day? At, and what, what, uh, tell us a little about the books you're reading and, and the things that inspire you. Oh man, well, I, it's all health books, really. I, people ask me, "Oh, are you what, are you reading in fiction or this or that?" I'm like, "No, it's just I've just read every health book I've ever heard of. It, maybe there's some that have slipped by, but uh, yeah, a lot of authors send them to me, and then I'll you know I do a lot of interviews for Peak Human, my podcast, so I have to keep up on my reading just to keep up with my guests. And yeah. What what's the thing that inspires you most in this journey of of health and wellness? Well, I guess it's I'm a sort of a communicator, right? I'm a mechanical engineer. I don't have a doctor in, in anything. I have a engineering degree, and I work with a doctor as a health coach, and I make a film. So what inspires me most is just communicating this stuff to other people. So I like to digest all this information to use a a nice food pun, uh, and get it out to people and, and try to package it in, in simple ways. I try to do that on my Instagram and make it kind of fun and interesting and, and in the film, right? It's just like a lot of people, well, most people aren't going to sit down and do all the things that I've done, read the books, go to the lectures, open up the papers, you know, scientific papers. Like, I mean, it's, it's a lot. So man, I just love to digest it and package it for people. And in doing uh, your your series on food lies, what was the biggest obstacle that sort of uh, was the challenge in in creating this series? Well, it's been five years, so really, it's we've never had money to do this correctly. I think it's actually a great thing because I've kind of rewritten it probably five times in the five years, and it keeps getting better and it keeps changing because I learn more. And I think it's yeah, you have to kind of go on a journey before you're ready to to produce, you know, your end results. And I think some people they just get caught. They're like, oh, I did this and it worked. And then that's it. I think that's what happens with plant-based people. They're like, 
oh yeah, you cut out a lot of processed garbage and then you feel better. And then you think it's the key to everything until you have nutrient deficiencies and you know everything catches up with you, right? So I think you, you, a lot of times you, you need to like try different things, go down different paths, go on the journey. And uh, so yeah, now we just released the intro on YouTube. So people should check it out. We spent over a year just on the intro. Not that it was the only thing we were doing, but we went all out. We handmade every shot. Like we're going big. Like this is trying to get on Netflix. You know, we want to get to the biggest po population possible. There's, I don't think there's ever been a big health film other than a vegan film that's made it to the mainstream, right? I mean, I guess there were some Michael Pollan films that kind of were big like 10 years ago, but really, I don't think there's ever been a health film that was accurate that actually talked about, you know, animal foods being good and that vegan is not the way to go, has ever made it to the mainstream. So, man, we've been, I've been interviewing people for five years. We had to redo interviews. I went to Africa last year, spent time with the Hadza and the Maasai, filmed with them, uh, been all over North America with different ranchers, different scientists. We're still getting a few more little interviews. So it's just been quite a journey. But yeah, check check out the intro on Food Lies YouTube. It's, it's And we're going to put the intro right on uh, uh, a link onto uh, this uh, conversation for sure. And I, I got a chance to watch it a little earlier. And it just visiting the Hadza, Look, looked like it was really an exciting adventure. Tell us, can tell us a little bit about uh, some insight there that'll get us inspired to watch more. Oh yeah! So the opening shot is me running with the Maasai. There's oh, a bunch the Maasai, of Maasai kids it, I'm it, running it. with. But yeah, the yeah, Hadza yeah. as well. So, oh wow, Hadza, they're the hunter gatherers. Maasai, they are pastoralists and they drink blood and milk and eat meat. Famously, the men. And so we did that with them, which was amazing. We woke up early and they had their little, their huts, you know, they, they move around. And so they had these like mud huts and grass and they have all their cows in the middle. And we, we drank the blood and we got the fresh raw milk and it was, it was actually decent. It tasted pretty good. The, it was, it was fun. Cause it, you know, it was sort of just like a tourist thing for us, but it was not a tourist thing at all. It was just them eating breakfast you know what i mean like they were all it wasn't like they were putting on a show for us you know like i've seen that like i'm from hawaii they do luau's and it's just a show no no these these dudes were getting breakfast like they were out there and they just took it and they're like no no we're drinking like we need we need our food amazing health just tall strong people big white teeth you know no cavities no problems uh amazing amazing stuff and then the hadza uh three days with them we were two different huds groups and we got to go hunting with them and and get some animals and eat them and it was pretty awesome they came back with this little deer the first day because we didn't get to go with them we got there too late and they opened it up for us and they started slicing it up they they sliced they cut the guts out fed them to the dogs or the dogs stole them i don't remember how it went down and uh, then we started eating the liver immediately they they got some fresh liver had all kinds of guts on it and everything. And they just like hand it to me. I eat it raw. And they're like, oh, this guy actually ate it. <laughs> you know, And uh, and then they they cooked the rest of it. And uh, we even ate the brains, actually. This little deer, they they cooked it. And then this kid, like the, he was with adults. He was maybe like 13. And he was gnawing on the head, you know, getting all the meat off the head. Then they cracked open the skull and you scoop out the pudding, basically. Uh, eat, eat those brains. So yeah, that was pretty wild. It is is the um, I'm sure in in Africa and all over the world the same things happening, where the the infiltration of modern lifestyles and diets. How are they affecting the Maasai and the the Hutsa? Oh wow, yeah, it's kind of bad actually because one of the Hutsa groups was really exposed to tourists and they keep getting treats and like everyone brings them stuff and they had really messed up teeth. Mm -hmm. And they, yeah, I mean, I just don't think they were as healthy as they could be. They also don't have any land. I think the, the main problem is these groups don't have any land. The government pushes them off the good mm -hmm. land and because they make uh, hunting res or uh, tourist, what is it called? Safari reserves, right? So that mm -hmm. you could, the tourists can come. They make tons of government, make tons of money, and they don't care about the people whose land it is. So they push them off. So now they can't hunt all the big animals anymore. 
and the, the odds that we're you know force it yeah get this tiny little deer or these tiny little uh, bush babies they're like this big it's like a softball and that's what they're trying to eat so that's a big problem but they're also getting all these other foods like ugali which is basically cornmeal and water and they're having to subsist on ugali so switching over to the maasai they still have their blood and milk and meat but they can't afford and they don't have all the abundance of cattle that they used to they can and they can't afford to keep killing them you know at least the blood and milk is renewable resource it's not like the animal dies because you take a little blood out of it mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. but still they, they can't really afford to keep killing them and eating them and they have to subsist or supplement their diet with this ugali and it's just cornmeal and water and it's just bad and you can see um the ill effects and if you get like kind of closer to the city it's almost like there's three different versions there's the the traditional living people like way out then there's the city people but then there's the in between and these the in between you can see a lot of ill health because they can't afford a lot of animal foods. So they're not getting much good nutrition and they're relying on the ugali or just a bunch of bananas, you know, or mm -hmm. just corn, just something, you know, just to fill their belly, some kind of agriculture crop that's really cheap and, and not very nutritious. And they kind of look like Americans, you know, they're like hunched over, they have all the, the chronic disease problems. And they're also getting the, the oils too. They're getting these cooking oils. We went to Uganda as well. And you could see these people, they don't even have fast food. They don't have processed foods. They don't like in Uganda that they just, they, they, it's, they're so poor. They can't even have these yet. They still are getting obese by the time they're like 45, 50. I saw these ladies who, and they're, they're just frying everything in these cooking oils. They get these new oils. And it was really interesting to throw one more thing in is the Maasai that we talked to an elder and he, he, he didn't know the science of like why seed oils are bad or you know why processed foods are bad or anything like that they're just like oh this is great these are calories you know most people just like oh this is great these are calories but this elder maasai gentleman who was super fit active he was like 90 something running up a mountain he was like i don't trust the grocery store food he's like i don't trust the oil like i don't trust the food that sits on the shelf you know he knew he knew through just like their ancient wisdom that if a food can just sit on a shelf or you have this fake oil that just sits in a plastic bottle, that it's not healthy. And he was, you know, trying to tell people like, we want the fat, we want the real, you know, the, the, the animal fat, like cook with that, you know, don't trust those store-bought foods. So that was interesting. So you've been on this journey of sharing uh, health, healthy living, healthy lifestyles, uh, um, assuming you're, you're in the omnivore world, but a, a, a meat centric or animal centric nutrition, some fruits and vegetables, any particular things that you, mm. you focus on? Yeah, I'm very animal based. I did the math. I, I don't think we ever need to count calories or think about all this stuff, but I did it once just to know I was 80% animal foods. Uh, I am very careful of what plant foods I eat. And I think it's the traditional ones and the ones that, um, you know, that I saw the Hadza eating, like the Hadza will get berries. So they'll eat honey when they can get it, you know, stuff like that. So I, I'm, that's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm on this journey and I, I will eat these foods that, uh, uh, you know, that I think are ancestral and I think that that work for me. And so I don't eat any grains. I don't eat legumes. I don't eat nuts. I don't eat seeds. I don't eat raw vegetables. I don't eat uh, leafy greens, but I do eat very specific things. Like I said, avocado, and I said sauteed mushrooms and onions, and and I would eat fermented vegetables. So I eat some sauerkraut, and I do eat some fruit and a little bit of honey. So I think these are very different than, it, it seems like, oh, this guy's just an omnivore, but it's like, no, no, no. This is like, I'm talking about like nine, types of foods that have low anti-nutrients and are prepared properly, which is what humans have always done. They've done fermenting, soaking, sprouting, all these type of methods to get rid of the anti-nutrients and make the foods safer and more bioavailable. And yeah, that's, that's kind of what I've landed on that I think um, works well. How young are you? I'm 39. And, and would you say you've been on this journey for uh, nine or 10 years uh, in the health and wellness since yes. you were 30, you said, and, and you've, you've been sharing and going around the world. 
would you say that you're finding some optimism in this story or or as you see the messiah and the hutza um that there's some concern and and things that we need to do to help protect um all of our ancient peoples and i say we're ultimately all ancient peoples that mm -hmm. that were suffering from this modern um a civilization of uh of um industrial foods mm -hmm. i have both so i am worried about the other places i've visited i visit south america mexico i visit europe africa australia southeast asia um some of these cultures are just a bit behind the us you know it feels like they are just getting the more of the processed foods in their diet and they're soon going to end up like the us I have the concerns over the, you know, the, the actual tribes out there trying to live ancestrally and the government moving them off their land, especially even with the, the Batwa, which are the pygmies, which we saw in Uganda. Mm -hmm. It's very bad over there. They have no land. They're highly marginalized people uh, because the mountain gorillas, they, the government moves them out of the forest where they naturally lived and ate meat. We talked to a lady, a pygmy she was the six it was six generations present she was the great 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 grandma and she was over a hundred dancing around like she was dancing and stomping and her daughter was 90 her her i think that was her youngest daughter who was still alive was 90 dancing around stomping around and they had four more generations and the the younger generations were the least healthy because they were eating the most just cheap process like all they had was like a bucket of of beans for like the whole day and she was telling the story of her growing up she would eat meat three times a day they would they lived in the forest and she she said we eat, we would eat meat three times a day and now we only get meat on christmas and easter it's the only time they can afford meat so so yeah the the, the their uh, situation is not looking good but then there, on the opposite side, there is a very positive kind of outlook because a lot of people are getting into this stuff. And maybe it's because I'm in Austin or maybe it's because I'm making this film and I, I track these people. But I see a huge momentum in people interested in regenerative agriculture and they're interested in animal based diets and they're changing their life and they're they're kind of separating from society. They, there's I see this kind of divergence where. A lot of people are just doubling down on processed foods and medications and just doing their thing. And then I just see this bigger group of people who are taking the health into their own hands. And again, maybe it's just because I'm self-selecting my group, but it is amazing. Like, oh man, there's huge momentum in Austin at least. Well, I, I feel it and see it. It seems like the, the keto carnival world seems to be expanding. Um, I think there's value in all sides. Um, adding more meat to our nutrition is is really seems to be growing. I mean, just as we're seeing, uh, the keto is still a much larger uh, Googled uh, term than than carnivore is, but that's a good sign that, you know, even if you're starting in the keto world and uh, you're venturing between carnivore and keto, those are all all really good things. Uh, what what uh, What's on the horizon for you in the next uh, six months or, or uh, five years in your dreams of, what what obviously you have this this uh, series to work on and get get moving forward, but there's got to be some dream work on the side also. Well, yeah, mainly the series. I I'm just so excited about it. Like I'm gonna go hard for six months and we'll get it out. That's our goal. So we're finishing by the end of the year. That's the big goal. Um, it's gonna take a lot of work. Uh, the nose to tail business. I really want to just keep pushing, you know, eating meat, eating, you know, find, lo, knowing your farmer. And if you can't know your farmer, then, you know, get it from us and, and regenerative ag and pushing that. And then I have one more thing. My big project is actually in Austin and I'm bringing all this stuff to real life. So that's my, my big goal is, you know, we, we do meat sales online and we do community stuff online, right? We're online right now. We got a community. It's great. People are watching. Let's do it in person. So I actually have a property in Austin now that's uh, a, a wellness center or it's, I don't know what it's called because I don't think it exists yet, but it has, you know, local meat. It's, it's not quite open yet. We had one event, but we, we have, you know, fresh local meats. We have highly, uh, well, nutritious and well-prepared food, like mm -hmm. uh, 
even like pates and like charcuterie and stuff like that cool. we have a, a vents it has an outdoor gym has a sauna cold plunge you have a fire pit and we have a grill like the ultimate grilling area we're building out right now and it has four different types of grills so the whole idea is to get everyone in person make this a hub and so yeah my ultimate dream is to have hubs around the united states and maybe world and you know get people there in person connect right that's that's what humans are supposed to do we're supposed to be around a fire eating meat and connecting and i just decided to make it happen and make make it a reality i went to my first meetup recently the northeast meetup with uh, carnivore doctor lisa wiedemann and kelly hogan uh it was really sort of a connection of uh like-minded people that have cured so many diseases uh psychological physical uh all sorts of things and and uh I think uh, the types of events that you're talking about are critical. KetoCon, CarnivoreCon, uh, all these events that, that are really important to share. Um, who's, who's out there inspiring you uh, in this world that, that's you know, uh, the, a particular um, hero in the keto carnivore world or someone that we should really be listening to because a scientist really is doing some cutting edge stuff? Oh, wow. There's so many people. Uh, I've interviewed 200 people. Wow. Yeah, for the film and for my podcast. And I am picky because I could just interview 200 random people too. <laughs> but uh, I've always been inspired by Mark Sisson. I, I have to credit him for number one because I that's who I found eight, nine years ago. And I read Primal Blueprint and changed my life. So he definitely, and he's in the film and, you know, it's great. We played ultimate frisbee together in Miami and uh, he's just the man. But I, but more recently, I think, I guess I'll throw out Dr. Bill Schindler. I don't know if you've heard of this guy. Have you Tell heard me of a him? little about, I've heard of him, but I don't know much about Bill. Okay. Dr. Bill Schindler. He was just in Austin for KetoCon. I've interviewed him multiple times. He's in the film. He is a paleoanthropologist, archaeologist, food scientist. He's had his own TV show on, I think it was Discovery Channel, where he lives through each like each era of human history. And each episode was him living through that era with his co-host, a woman. And they only could use the tools that were available to that era of human to survive. So he was out there with a rock. The first era, it's like all they had was a rock. And they would, you know, they had to like try to build a shelter, like crack open bones to eat marrow. And, the, you know, then it went to fire. Then it went, you know, went to a bow and arrow and all that type of stuff. So he's just doing amazing things and just kind of spreading the information of how humans should eat. And he talks about a lot of this stuff about how, well, important animal foods were to growing our brain, becoming human, all this stuff. He's just obsessed with eating those to tail eating, you know, bone marrow and, and the liver and the organs and the brains, even the whole story of, of how we became human, but also how, if you do eat plant foods, how you have to prepare them not, uh, properly because there's so many anti-nutrients and so many problems with them. So he goes around the world studying them too. And it's really interesting. And, 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 uh, for, for all of us moving forward, what, what would be some salient recommendations for sort of, I, I, I don't mean it, you know, so the, the regular, all of us regular people, we need some simple advice that we can just kind of take in our hand and, and, and go out there in this world and live. What would be your simple advice for most of us um, that may not know much about the science of food or, or, um, even sort of what's going on mm -hmm. in food lies, but just some inspirational concepts and ideas that you could share uh, sort of in some closing moments here. Okay. I got a tagline. It is eat densely, move intensely. So eat densely means eat nutrient dense foods, which means basically animal foods. <laughs> and you, you could, you could see other nutrient dense foods that you could fit in there from the plant world, if you'd like and move intensely means like I said, sprint, you know, do lift some weights, do some jumping jack, you know, do some squats, whatever you can do, play a sport. And why I chose that tagline is it's kind of the just way better version of eat less, move more. Eat less, move more is meaningless. If it meant anything, people, we, would, we wouldn't be in the situation we are in. Eat less, move more is actually just kind of a recipe to be hungry. You think about it, eat less, move more. It's like, oh wait, so that just sounds like I'm gonna be starving. 
And that their idea is to just, that's their idea to lose weight is just starve yourself and always be hungry and just jog and eat like plant foods and just be eat a salad with no dressing. So it's, it's pretty bad advice, but you know, eat densely, move intensely actually means something. <laughs> And 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 a uh, uh, quick question on on supplements. Do do we need supplements? Do you think is there any good scientific evidence uh, that if you eat a a um, a, a dense nutritional palate uh, that mm -hmm. you need supplements? I do not think supplements are necessary. I'm not a fan. I could see sometimes if you are like wildly deficient. I think it's like a thing. It's it's almost like a medical in intervention. I actually thought this recently. Instead of medications, we should be using supplements as a temporary intervention. You know what I mean? It's like r real food, diet and lifestyle should be your medicine, your your baseline, right? Of life and nutrition and just your health. But if you have a problem, it's probably just because you're lacking in some sort of mineral or you know maybe you don't have you've had years and years of metabolic damage and you're really lacking in something so i was thinking about that maybe it is good to just for like an intervention right it's like oh man your copper is like way down you know you can take some copper or you could just eat some liver and oysters and get some copper but 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 yeah generally i i do not think we need them uh what about what's your take on water and and uh how much water should we drink in a day mineral water sparkling water uh, mm. uh let's see brain smart water smart water uh, <laughs> yeah yeah the water's an interesting one uh i like to drink like a nice filtered water right so i i do have a good berkey filter i think uh the, there's some good mineral waters out there if it's it's i don't know if you, you can afford it like gerald steiner has a lot of magnesium and a lot of good minerals in it so it'd be nice if i could just drink oh there we go that's, yeah. that's sort of my 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 drink but uh, just Cena, yeah i didn't know that yeah i would i would be drinking a gerald a day for sure actually I, I think i'm just gonna start doing that um yeah i think i but i also don't think i think people are obsessed with water i i think there's been this weird thing where people are like trying to drown themselves in water <laughs> too too much water too yeah. much water. So the the recommendations of water are 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 far too great, likely for all of us. And and besides the industrialization of the food industry in the world, the industrialization of water. Uh, I'm sure you saw that um, you know the bottling of water is is significantly reducing water uh, for many uh, local uh, environments around the globe for those that are doing sort of small farming and and, and things like that. Um, it is, it is quite amazing how we're seeing sort of the industrialization of the water as you travel mm -hmm. to, to, or, or in all the, the places of the world. Yeah. I mean, there's like Nestle water bottle, you know, like different brands of Nestle or Coca-Cola or whatever it is, they're everywhere. It's insane. Well, I really appreciate you being on with us today and, uh, we can, uh, find Brian Saunders, uh, Sanders, uh, at, uh, and look at his food lies. Uh, what's your website they could find you at? Well, sabian.org kind of links out to my projects. So at sabian.org, you can find the foodlies.org website. You can find my nosetail.org website. And then, yeah, I'm just on social media at Food Lies. Just search for Food Lies on any platform, YouTube, Instagram, whatever, and I'm there. And so we're really uh, um, so grateful to you for being on with us today and uh everyone out there you got to check out uh food lies and uh is there any need for uh are you guys doing any funding for you know social funding for oh food yeah lies, by the way yeah absolutely with this new intro we were trying to get a, a boost of funding to help us finish it so that's on indiegogo but you can link to that from foodlies.org awesome awesome so remind everyone again we're going to put a link Check out uh, Brian Sanders. Uh, so much to learn from, and I really appreciate everyone being here today. And uh, God bless, and thanks for all the questions. And uh, sorry we didn't get to too many, but mm -hmm. we got to a lot of words and inspiration uh, from Brian. So, again, thank you, everyone, for being here. And, Brian, thank you so much. Really appreciate you. Awesome. Thanks for having me. All right. Always a pleasure. God bless.